go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today for this first day of the um, CNI 2020 uh, fall virtual meeting. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and I'll be introducing the session. Uh, just a couple of um, quick logistical things. Uh, you have a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can use that to pose questions um, and we'll take all the questions at the end. Um, there's also a chat box. You're welcome to introduce yourself in there and to use that as we go along. Um, at the end of the session, um, Diane Goldenberg Hart of CNI will beam into existence and um, will moderate the Q and A. Uh, everybody is muted at the moment, uh, except for our presenters. Closed captioning is available if uh, you'd like to uh, make use of it. And um, I don't really think I need to say much more about the mechanics um, other than the session is being recorded and will be available later. Now, let me introduce the session really briefly. Um, we have uh, with us from the uh, Wild Cornell Medical Center, um, both uh, Terry Wheeler and uh, Peter Oxley. Um, Peter will be doing the presentation. Terry will uh, join Peter to um, uh, handle the Q&A. And um, this is a session I'm really looking forward to because it, it weaves together quite a number of issues about how to um, essentially document and share research work. Um, and uh, it's got a, it, it, it incorporates a strong commitment to reproducibility. It gets at how we manage research workflows. Um, it also um, has some uh, very specific and interesting issues because um, as, as a medically situated um, uh, uh, piece of work, it has to deal with some confidential data where the sharing is, um, is limited. Uh, it also um, uh, very provocatively incorporate, uh, gets it how to deal with electronic uh, lab notebooks as part of the flow here. So I think you'll find this uh, very, very interesting. And as I say, I'm really looking forward to it. And with that, let me just thank Peter and Terry for joining us and hand it over to Peter. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Cliff, for that, that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present what we've been doing here at Wild Cornell. And uh, I'm excited to be able to share what we have uh, been wrestling through in, in terms of research reproducibility and, and how we can in, improve this uh, for the institution and for our researchers. So I, I hope there's uh, some, some lessons that will be of benefit to everyone who's tuning in to watch now or uh, the recordings uh, later. And uh, it, it's going to be a, a very quick run through with, with the, the limited time we have, uh, but uh, don't, don't hesitate to ask detailed questions uh, at the end. And I'm happy to, uh, to go a little bit more into the weeds with, with people afterwards, um, if, if that helps. And uh, so I wanna, I wanna start with how um, our, our journey begins and, and what are some of the motivating factors for us uh, and uh, as, as we started to, to really earnestly uh, engage with the, the issue of research reproducibility, there were three factors that uh, are prime, primary drivers towards why we want to uh, do this better um, and, and these will probably be very familiar uh, to uh, many if not most of you but uh, it's, it's always worth revisiting and uh, allowing these things to, to shake us up a little bit uh, because these are issues of genuine concern and we as institutions that, that value uh, contributing towards the scientific endeavor want to be helping as, as much as we can to uh, address each of these uh, in turn and uh, so the, the first of these is what is uh, better known as, as the reproducibility crisis. And 
uh, you've, you've probably heard this phrase, it's, it's probably been, uh, in fact, perhaps a little overblown or overused now even. Uh, and while we could, in fact, spend our whole time today even just debating what reproducibility means, uh, I think it's important to recognize that, that reproducibility on many different levels is an important hallmark of what science is. And uh, it is one area that we are, everyone, uh, can can always be working to do better at. And so uh, there, there's been numerous studies that have come out over uh, the, the years, particularly in, in the last decade or so, uh, attempting to reproduce at some level uh, established scientific papers of the past. And uh, they, they basically all come to consistent conclusions that depending on how uh, detailed you want that reproduction to be, it is in fact very difficult to properly reproduce a lot of work uh, that has made it into the published record of science. And uh, on this screen here, I'm showing you uh, a, a slightly older but uh, perhaps uh, well-known study from, from John uh, Ioannidis uh, who, who looked at uh, the specific field of molecular biology and uh, what I, the reason I want to highlight this one is because it shows nicely the, the breakdown of, of issues that they identified in attempting to analytically reproduce uh, a number of, of uh, papers. They weren't experimentally trying to reproduce the, the work or biologically uh, reproduce it. Um, but you can see here that uh, we, we have you know, more, than, more than half of the papers uh, could not be reproduced. And when you look at the reasons for that, uh, half of them was because the, the data were not available to be able to run the uh, analysis on. Uh, and then we have other issues in, including software availability uh, and, and the methods uh, that had been provided being unclear. And these are not uh, deep philosophical issues that are hard to root out. These, these are actually very, uh, at one level, uh, surface level issues that we can begin to chip away at and, and try to improve on in, in terms of, of helping this, this process of reproducibility. Now, uh, connected to this, this first made motivating factor uh, is the, the mandates that are coming from funding bodies and industry and, and, and government uh, more uh, more loudly uh, as as the years come by and, and more explicitly, and uh, it is related in many parts uh, in in many ways to the issues that we just saw previously, where data availability is is really important, uh, particularly when that uh, when, when those data have been gathered using uh, publicly provided funding or taxpayer funds, and uh, so there's there's just a, a scattering of uh, I requirements that I've, I've put onto the, the screen here that uh, involve uh, NIH and, and NSF um, and, and others. And, and there are funder mandates, there are legal mandates as well that the um, institutions need to be aware of. And, and these are the more straightforward uh, of the retention requirements that researchers need to be aware of. And uh, they can become much more convoluted and, and hard to predict. Uh, such as in, in some instances, there is a, a legal requirement to be able to access the original data for a study uh, up to uh, six years after the last citation by the original authors of the original paper. And this, uh, this particular requirement for data retention is uh, ultimately unknowable at the time of publication. You, you don't know how long your retention period has to be in that case because it depends on, on what happens in the future. And so data retention in itself, uh, even when the rules uh, and requirements can be clear, can be very complicated to, to implement. And uh, while many institutions will uh, consider the, the researchers as the appropriate steward of the research data, uh, while they are actively working on a, on a project or while they are at least uh, active faculty members of the institution, uh, the institution does still have 
um, a, a right of, of ownership uh, of the data. They have their own legal responsibilities for uh, data retention and being able to provide those data. And uh, as such, they the institution needs to to take responsibility for how it is handled as well. Not to mention the fact that uh, when researchers move on uh, to another institution or, or retire, then uh, the the data that is left still uh, has to be be managed by someone. Um, and so these these are important things uh, for an institution uh, to to be considering and working towards. Uh, and our third motivating factor. It, and, and perhaps the, uh, the more insidious uh, negative uh, factor here is, is the persistent presence of academic misconduct in science. And I have a couple of quotes here from uh, some of the, the more well-known studies that have, have looked into that, this uh, in, in the last decade. And uh, while uh, we, we may not be heading towards a, a, a crisis of academic misconduct, uh, nonetheless, it, it is certainly persistent uh, and we, we certainly want to be doing what we can to uh, disincentivize academic misconduct within our own institutions, uh, help uh, researchers to be able to, to police it themselves and identify it uh, when it's happening within their labs. And uh, another aspect of this, of course, is that uh, there is an increasing number of, of allegations against institutions as far as academic misconduct is concerned. And so even when there isn't genuine misconduct occurring, uh, the, the accusations that come in uh, need to be addressed. And so the institution, in order to be able to appropriately defend its researchers who are doing the right thing and doing honest research, needs to be able to easily um, and quickly address the allegations that, that come in. And so, uh, being having systems in place for uh, robust research reproducibility uh, internally will substantially help towards this effort as well. Uh, so, as much as these three uh, drivers uh, have have something of a, of a push factor towards uh, pushing us towards uh, reproducibility, we of course also as an institution have our own ethical uh, mandate. And, and a desire to maximize the value that comes out of every data set that is gathered. And uh, particularly when we're looking at medical research and uh, the, the fact that uh, there have been patients that have been part of this process, uh, we, we have this uh, ethical obligation to do our science with integrity and to have responsible use of the patient data. And uh, this is intimately linked to re, uh, research reproducibility practices uh, because you you cannot guarantee that a patient's data have been used ethically uh, unless you're able to validate the research that that patient's own uh, data have enabled uh, and so uh, we we strive to to maximize the the value of the data that we've been collecting in the research enterprise as well and so all of this feeds back into a, a desire to to improve our research reproducibility practices now quickly um, some things that we're not trying to claim that we are doing here uh, in in this uh, presentation uh, the the systems that we are, are going to present to you today do not automatically make research reproducible uh, reproducible uh, that comes from uh, improving reporting standards at, at the point of publication. Uh, that, re that requires having uh, clear principles of reproducibility, uh, such as the, the FAIR uh, principle for findable, accessible, interoperable, um, and reusable information. Uh, ideas like literate programming, uh, which have been around for a long time now. Um, and uh, having communities of practice uh, such as uh, with, with open, the open science community and uh, more specific uh, communities such as the Turing Way. Uh, and, and these groups working with researchers to identify how uh, at the, the level of publishing into the academic community, uh, research can become more reproducible. Instead, what we are wanting to provide here at Wild Cornell is uh, an infrastructure that helps to make uh, the the research research reproducible can we give them 
can we give the scientists the tools that enable them to make their research more reproducible um, and uh, perhaps to to take a phrase from the Turing way can, can we make it uh, too easy not to do uh, so what we're trying to capture then is uh, can we identify and uh, and track the the raw data that are being generated as part of the research process are we able to describe and uh, again uh, store the workflows uh, that have been used and applied to those data and then link both of these to the results uh, which typically are the the end product and, and what does get published and and can we can we track these and store them appropriately and then uh, find them and, and bring them back to bear when necessary uh, either for further research uh, or for uh, defending against uh, legal challenges or, or uh, claims of, of misconduct. Now in order to do all of this uh, we, we need to deal with a number of hurdles. Uh, none of these are unique to Wild Cornell. Uh, I'm sure uh, that many of these things are, you, you can all uh, identify with uh, and so they include things like the fact that we have lots of confidential data as part of our uh, research projects. And so we have to be very careful uh, to make sure that we're, we're handling uh, those, those data according to appropriate secure, uh, security standards. And uh, so that, of course, as, as far as research reproducibility, uh, there's, there's open and then there's, there's open. So we, we have to figure out ways of being able to uh, still be able to track the work that was done in a reproducible way that does not involve actually exposing uh, the the data necessarily to to everybody, uh, but but still being able to provide it to the right people when when appropriate. Uh, the second hurdle is of course researchers are incredibly busy already doing the research. They don't want to have added to their plate uh, fifty different things that they must now also do to meet institutional policies and uh, to, to make their work more reproducible. Uh, and, and so even though uh, most researchers would certainly agree with the goals of reproducible research, they, they don't want to have these extra burdens placed on them, uh, which slows down uh, the, the primary goal of, of doing the research. So uh, we, we need to come up with a solution that, that does not add effort uh, to the researchers, but removes uh, the effort required for them to, to do the work and, and make it reproducible as it, as it should be. Uh, we are a very large organization. We do a lot of different kinds of research. And so that means that the data and workflows that we deal with are incredibly diverse. Uh, they're generated from all sorts of different systems. Uh, the uh, analytical pipelines exist on very different forms of infrastructure. And so being able to capture all of that and, and having a system that is flexible enough uh, that it will be able to apply to as broad a spectrum of, of research as possible uh, is, is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, and finally, uh, in, in terms of data retention, we also want to make sure that our solution uh, becomes a place of, of high quality uh, data retention and, and research reproducibility. We, we can't create a system that becomes just a dump, an electronic dumping ground for everybody's data and workflows that then makes it actually really difficult to sift through and identify the, the relevant data and workflows when it is required, uh, not to mention the, the costs of, of maintaining uh, irrelevant pieces of information within that system. Uh, so these, these are some of the things that have been very uh, front and center of our considerations for, for how we, we build the system. Uh, and so we've, we've come up with essentially a, a four piece uh, solution that we are, are putting, fitting together to work together to, to address all of these issues uh, that I've uh, raised uh, already this afternoon. And so piece number one is to have uh, a, a supported uh, electronic lab notebook solution uh, that will allow the researchers to uh, capture small data sets and uh, the basic workflows within the lab uh, that also allows the, the flexibility uh, to, to meet lots of the, the research needs of, of uh, the different projects. 
And uh, so there, there are many different electronic lab notebooks out there um, and uh, yeah, I, that different ones will fit different institutions. We are going with lab archives uh, and uh, but that's not necessarily, I, I don't want to say endorse that above all others. Uh, but in our case, uh, this, this works very well for us because uh, the solution that we have with them allows uh, us to have direct storage of raw data files and uh, automated, uh, in fact, automated capture of files that are being produced off research equipment into lab notebooks. Uh, they also allow the, the capture of um, analytical workflows by integrating with a number of uh, software tools that researchers use for their analysis, making it easier for them to do their work internal uh, to the notebook or connected to the notebook so that it is automatically capturing the work that they are already doing. Um, and because of its, its basic layout uh, and, and providing effectively uh, the researchers the ability to choose how they, they upload and, and organize the data internal uh, to the, each individual notebook, uh, it, it gives a degree of flexibility as to, to how it is used for capturing the research data. Uh, they have file versioning and immutable timestamps, uh, which be can become very important for uh, being able to, to track when research was uh, done at a particular time. Uh, and uh, I'm now working with the Lab Archives team uh, on integrating their notebook with uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, so uh, they have, they've already uh, started to build an extension on their end uh, for display of notebooks within, uh, display of Jupyter notebooks within Lab Archives. Uh, and I'm also building a, a Jupyter Lab extension using their APIs that will enable people who do uh, computational work within Jupyter uh, to be able to uh, access data that is stored on their Lab Archives notebooks. Uh, as well as, as upload the Jupyter Notebooks as well into the electronic lab notebook system. Uh, so further allowing a capture of, of uh, a multitude of different uh, computational workflows uh, in a single location. Of course, these lab notebooks themselves are trackable, uh, identifiable, shareable uh, between uh, people uh, within a lab or between labs. And uh, ultimately, as faculty members move on, those uh, uh, notebooks can be shared and, and uh, given over to a, a new person uh, so that we as an institution will always have uh, access to the work that is, has been done within them. Uh, piece number two is to have a file management system uh, for everything that doesn't fit within the electronic lab notebooks uh, so that we can still tag and track the other data and, and files that are being produced. And uh, so we, we are working with uh, Starfish for this uh, uh, to produce a system that, that allows the, the researchers to continue to work within the institutional storage solutions that we have provided, the various file share uh, solutions, but uh, in a way that will now allow us to identify which files are associated with a particular project uh, so that we can then uh, more readily uh, access those. Uh, and so this, this works in essence by uh, allowing a researcher uh, within the, the file system to flag uniquely folders and files that are associated with a project or a publication. And uh, then all such files that have those flags can be uh, appropriately uh, hashed to provide a unique uh, identifier that will uh, allow us in, in essence to validate uh, in the future that uh, any specific file that we are attempting to uh, retrieve is in fact the same file that was originally tagged by the researcher. Uh, also, the primary uh, feature of, of the, the tracking system uh, itself is, is its ability to track where files are, are moved to within institutional storage. So even if the researcher uh, relocates their data sometime down the, in the future, uh, the, the Starfish system is able to find where those files have been placed as long as it's within the institutional storage. And, and then finally, we can pre create actionable scripts uh, allowing researchers to uh, indicate when they're finished with a research project and that we, we need to now move into uh, an a, a archive state 
uh, for for the project uh, or to to capture uh, something more of, of these files uh, for for the future. Piece number three uh, is to provide secure file access management, and and this uh, is done through our uh, data core at Wild Cornell, and and this really is uh, uh, the, a unique piece based on our, our patient. Uh, inf uh, patient data that uh, will be needed uh, for uh, for much of the uh, the researchers here, and so what we do in essence with Data Core is provide a a virtual uh, secure collaborative uh, workspace that allows uh, all appropriately authorized people to gain access to a specific set of data. Uh, and software tools in order to do the research as allowed by the data governance uh, that maps to those data sets. All of that is then monitored for the life cycle of the project by the data core uh, curation team uh, who track uh, expiry dates and authorization and uh, also other requirements for data retention or data destruction at the, the end of the project life cycle uh, to ensure that um, all of these requirements are met, uh, saving the researcher from having to, uh, to remember all of these things. Um, and uh, then also, when necessary, providing curation for data import or export, um, either directly to the researchers or between third-party data providers. So these are all the essential pieces of the infrastructure, uh, but how do we connect these to pro provide a, a sort of single solution that ties them all together? And, and the answer for us is through our data catalog. And so the data catalog uh, not only provides a place to capture metadata associated with any uh, particular data source, but it ties it to projects, to grants, to publications, and to each of these other infrastructure tools that we've just looked at. Uh, and so uh, the, the catalog functions on the back end uh, of the data cores uh, administration system so that it allows the curation staff to be able to track data use agreements, uh, governance expiry, appropriate uh, authorization of, of users to access those data. Uh, it is also able to capture the uh, unique tags that Starfish generates uh, so that uh, when uh, a researcher has generated uh, a new data set associated with a publication or with a grant, uh, they uh, are then redirected by Starfish into the data catalog so that they're prompted to, to enter in uh, at least a, a minimal amount of, of information about the data to help make it findable uh, and more reusable in the future. But also then it becomes trackable because the data catalog has a, that unique uh, flag which is then able to pass back to Starfish should someone uh, need to recover those those data files uh, and uh, so use therefore allow the Starfish system to go and appropriately track down, validate with the hash uh, and then present the uh, the files uh, to uh, to the appropriate uh, individuals. Now this at the moment is still behind a, a curation team. We don't uh, serve up files. Uh, to anybody who, who searches or asks for them, but the ability to be able to, uh, down the line, flag levels of access as well uh, as, as tracked by the data catalog is, is something that we're, we're keen to, to try and develop. Uh, and then finally, the, the unique tags associated with each of the electronic lab notebooks uh, is also stored within the catalog so that um, any notebooks that are used as part of a project or as part of a publication can likewise be tracked down, uh, enabling a request to be made to the, the PI or the, the faculty member to share access uh, of that lab book with the appropriate researcher um, if, if necessary. And all of that then is also built with the discovery layer within the catalog, uh, which allows uh, individuals from Wild Cornell uh, to be able to search not only data, but uh, data use agreements, reuse conditions, uh, of the data authorization levels uh, for access to, uh, to help people understand not only what is available internally within the institution uh, for sharing, but um, under what conditions and, and for what purposes. Um, and so uh, together this is, is maximizing 
um, each of the these uh, data sets that we're we're producing, uh, and um, so we are uh, as such um, particularly for for larger patient data sets that have been built uh, are able to uh, make them available and discoverable to to the largest number of people that can then be provided with appropriate access to do their research. Uh, and so finally, uh, and briefly, uh, the, the triggers to prompt all of this uh, is project and grant completion, publication, um, or a faculty member leaving the institution uh, then lead, uh, leads to making sure that all of the, the research is appropriately stored within the catalogue. Uh, and uh, I will finish uh, with a quick point out to, to the many hands that have, have made this system uh, what it is today. And uh, if we have time for questions, um, happy to take them now. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that's a really interesting integrated system. Um, and I realize that we are right at time, but we do have one question. So we'll go ahead and uh, take that now. Uh, what infrastructure is the data catalog running on? Yep. Uh, so it is uh, built, it is using the, the Django uh, web framework uh, to host the front end. It uses a Postgres database, which is actually AWS hosted uh, in the back. And uh, we use Elastic Beanstalk to, uh, as the, the infrastructure that everything uh, sort of sits on top of to be able to, to serve the data. There's, there's no protected health information that's stored within the catalog itself. It, it doesn't store PHI. Uh, it, it is only storing those, those pointers to the governance uh, and the authorization. Great. Okay, thank you for that answer. And thank you so much for that question. Um, and our questioner thanks you as well, Peter, for that question. Um, I really want to thank our presenters for uh, being here with us today at CNI, and I also want to thank all of our attendees for making time um, in their busy days to join us today. As we are a little bit past time there, I don't want to hold folks up anymore, but I will invite anyone who would like to stick around after I turn off the recording um to sort of approach the um the podium and have a chat with our um presenters we'd be delighted to have you do that we can turn your microphones on and you can ask live questions or make comments so with that i'm going to thank peter and terry again thank you all for joining us and uh, we will be back in about a half hour with our next session as part of cni's fall 2020 meeting take care everyone be well <laughs>